very informal presentation uh, during all four sessions. Anytime you have a question, let's go back to school. If you'll just kind of lift your hand, we'll stop and we'll take your question and we'll try to answer it. Our hope and objective is that when you leave here, you have somewhat of a foundation to be able to go to the bee yard and not be scared to death of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Most of us as new beekeepers, when we first start out, anxiety and fear is a huge factor. And we want to try to put that to bed as much as we can and give you some foundational truths that will help you at least know, like, I got this. I can do it. And if you'll go into that bee yard in that hive with that attitude, you'll be fine. Uh, how many beekeepers do we have here that have, have been keeping bees? This gentleman, these folks, how many years you've been keeping bees? Well, if I keep them alive, four years. Four years? And you, ma'am? <laughs> okay, okay. Anybody else? So, I was telling these folks here, you can take a hundred beekeepers, and you'll get a hundred different opinions on what to do, how to do, and the best way to keep bees. The best teacher you'll ever have in keeping bees is your experience. And sometimes it's just a matter of rolling up our sleeves, diving into it, and doing the very best that we know to do. My hope is to help you have some of the elements to help you to know what to look for, what processes to take, uh, the best ways to be able to address certain situations. I am a third generation beekeeper. My grandfather kept bees and when I was a little tyke, I used to love to go to the bee yard with him. My dad kept bees and I've had the fortune of keeping bees uh, for the past several years. And honestly, I dearly love the opportunity. I say, and I, I attest to this and say this repeatedly, the honeybee is probably one of the closest miracles to seeing the witness of God that you'll ever see in everyday life. They're absolutely a fascinating creature, and when you learn how they process, how they work, their social order, and all of that, you'll see that they really don't need you. They know what they're doing. Our job is to accommodate them to do the best they can with what they know to do. And today and the next three Saturdays, we hope that we can help accomplish that. Any questions right out of the gate? Okay, today we're going to try to spend our time talking about you and the hive setup, what it looks like, and where to set up at. So I want to talk about hive parts. I want to talk about you as far as being equipped. And then I want to talk about where to position your hives. Next week, we'll talk about in depth the actual honeybee, the process of their social order, and everything that it looks like. How many, are, how many here have been uh, in a place where you had a honeybee just whiz by, do a flyby, and you went to swatting, doing this number? Okay, don't do that. <laughs> just real bluntly. The honeybee is not an aggressive creature. They really don't want to mess with you, but they don't want you messing with them. So if you start trying to defend yourself in front of them, they're going to become defensive as well. If you've ever raised horses, you know that a horse can sense how nervous you are when you walk up to them. The honeybee will sense the same thing. If they know you're nervous and you're anxious and you're scared, they'll pick that up and they'll become a little more defensive with you. By and large, the honeybee is not aggressive. Once in a while you'll get a hive, and I can tell you a couple of stories, but once in a while you'll get a hive that's kind of ornery. But by and large, most honeybees, they're there to do a job. They know what their job is. The worker knows what their job is. And they don't want your interference, and they don't want to interfere with what you're doing. So if you can learn to relax and just not be anxious and not be afraid of them, you'll get along so much better with them. I've seen people work, my grandfather used to work his bees in a short sleeve shirt. He would always wear a hive because where you get stung in the face, it, it can be a little bit of a, a serious issue. But as far as being stung on the arms or on the legs or anywhere else beside the face, uh, it's not really much of a challenge for you. After a while, you get thick skinned and the sting really doesn't bother you too much. So the big thing that I would say in all of that is relax. Just do your best to relax. 
and enjoy what you're doing and not be afraid. The anxiety and the nervousness they'll pick up on and they will in turn change their temperament because of that. So a couple of things to tell you before we go into what to wear. When you go to your bee yard, ladies, do not wear cologne. Do not wear hairspray. They sense those smells and they'll, you'll attract them like big time. Uh, so if you can stay away from the cologne, if you can stay away from the hairspray, don't eat bananas, anything with a banana in it, stay away from it. Bananas make them real defensive for whatever reason, and they'll get in attack mode with, with that scent. So there's just few things like that that you want to take precaution of. You really don't have to dress up for them. They'll be okay seeing you just like you are when you get out of bed every morning with no makeup and no hairspray on your hair, okay? Uh, any questions? So when you're going to your bee yard, you, I want to encourage you to suit up. Uh, I'm going to share a lot of what I do personally. I am not an expert beekeeper, but I've done it long enough that I, I, I really enjoy being there. I'm comfortable with them and uh, don't mind at all working in the hive. I use a jacket and I do have a hood. I always want to wear a hood. You always want to protect your face. Honeybees will find the nostril or the earlobe and the dark place is what they find. And when you get them up in those places and you happen to get stung, it's pretty painful and it can cause some serious damage. You do not want to get stung in the eye. I've been stung on the cheeks and on the side of the face and you'll swell up or turn a little red. Everybody acts, reacts different. If you have an allergic reaction to them and you know this, carry an ep, uh, EpiPen Make sure that you have one close because if it causes reaction with you, you need to take care of that and address it immediately. If you get stung on the neck or anything like that, it could be a life-threatening situation. So use wisdom in those situations. Um, they do have full body suits that you can wear depending on your comfort level and what you feel that you need. I usually wear baggy pants and a jacket uh, and I will tell you in July and August, even the jacket gets extremely hot. Uh, they do have, at the hardware, they have these uh, breathable outfits, uh, jackets, and I have one. And they have the breathe breathable full cover all suit. They're really nice. They allow the heat to escape a lot better and makes it a lot better for you. But get you a good jacket. Make sure you're zipped up all the way. Make sure that when you get this top zipper zipped, that you know that it's secure. I, they do find them little holes. And uh, I was in a bee yard in Blue Eye for uh, Jim Baker down at his place for the guy that was taking care of them. And we had a hive that we were working in. Uh, they were a little excited, uh, but not, nothing really terrible. And we're working away, and all of a sudden, I've got a bee in my veil. And I'm like, uh-oh. Well, I'm trying to stay calm and continue to work, and all of a sudden, here comes another one, and I'm like, I'm fixing to get in trouble here. So we continue to work, and, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, one of them hits me right here and stings me. When he stung me, that hive lit up like a Christmas tree. They went nuts, and I immediately walked away. The guy that was with me, I said, let's walk away from this hive. They followed us 50 yards until we got back to the truck, and I was able to peel my veil back and get the other bee out of there with it getting stung. But when they do sting you, they, it alerts, it sounds an alarm to the hive and it lets them know that there's danger, they have took action, and then the rest of the hive kind of gets excited with them. So make sure you're buttoned up really good. Uh, most of your suits have cuffs on your hands. I wear a pair of gloves with mine most of the time, once in a while, when I'm feeling really brave and daring, I'll uh, go in without gloves. Depending on the hive, too, you will learn the temperament of your hives as you go. You'll get some hives that are just very docile. They don't mind you being there. It's okay. And then you'll get some hives that they really don't want you there. And they'll let you know. You'll have them buzzing around your head. Uh, and it's okay for them to buzz around your head, but when they start bouncing off your veil, you know you've got them pretty agitated. Any questions? Any experiences that you want to share? Yes, sir. Are there different breeds that are more aggressive than others? Or? 
There is. Um, normally what you'll see around here, the normal standard around here is the Italian. Italians are a great bee for beginners because they are pretty docile. Uh, I like New World Carnolians. They're even more docile. They're harder to come by. You have to kind of breed into those. Um, you can get some bees out of South Texas. Uh, they're pretty ornery because what has happened over the years, um, the, the killer bee that came out of Africa, the name slipped me right now, but I'll think of it in a minute, has migrated from South America up into the southern parts of the states, and they're interbreeding with some of our hives down there, and we're seeing a little bit of that going on. So once in a while, you'll see an ornery hive, and uh, it, it causes a lot of havoc and create, creates a lot of problems. But as far as new beekeepers, uh, you can get the Italian. The Italian's a good docile breed. Carnolians are a good docile breed. Russians are not bad. They're a pretty good breed. They're excellent workers. Uh, once in a while you'll get a testy hive, but most of them by and large, uh, there's some folks north of Springfield, Alexa and Alex, they raise Russians and they sell Russians and they get along great with them. Their four-year-old son mills through the bee yard in his diaper and gets along fine, no problem. Temperament of the bees is a big thing. The queen actually determines the temperament of the bees. If you get a hive that's really ornery and cantankerous and you have a hard time working with them and every time you go down there, they're all over you and they're bouncing off your veil and they're wanting to try to get to you, that's your queen. Paint your head off and buy a new queen. <laughs> if you're going to do this, you want to enjoy your experience. Okay? I say that tongue in cheek. You know, there's a process to all of that, but your queen really determines the temperament of the hive. So you can know that if you get a hive that's a little feisty, and honestly, there's so much more than just the queen. Weather conditions, if it's going to be a stormy day or if a storm's coming, that hive will, will react differently. Their temperament will be different. I mean, I never get into my hive on a, a day like today or a day like yesterday where we had a front coming in. They know that. They're the best weather forecasters you can ask for. So you look at those things, and if you get a good sunny day that's 75 degrees, and you go down and, you, and there's not a lot of wind, you get down in your beehive, and every time you do and you've got good conditions like that, and that hive is real testy and real aggressive with you, then the, your queen temperament is the problem there. So you want to keep in mind all of those factors, and you kind of just have to assess that and do the best you can with it. Yes, sir. I just call them on killer bees because they're always on an attack. Right? All I got to do is go by them. I can be calm and everything, but I just mostly leave them alone because I, once I lift that lid up, they're just all over you. Yeah, and it, you can't really do anything with a hive like I, that. I, I haven't. I, that's why I got I wear a bee suit. And sometimes yeah. they sting right through it. But I heard. Uh, Bee stings are good for arthritis. <laughs> they are. Bee stings are very good for arthritis. However, I would like to be in charge of that and not them. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, talking about the species of bees. Now, I've read that the carnolians are more disease resistant than the tag. Is that right? They are. Yeah. I also heard that the uh, Russians are uh, resistant to the royal mite. They have more resistance to, I won't say they're totally resistant, yeah. but they have a better ability to resist and ward off and fight off the varroa mite. That is correct. Now, if you set up maybe like a hive battalion or carnolians, then a hive of Russians, will they interbreed? And maybe they take some bees like the carnolians, they have to take some of that from the Russian bees to help them be a little more resistant? Um, Yes and no. So what happens is when your hive swarms, you'll have to watch me. I'm really like an old rabbit dog. I get on a trail and you'll never know where I wind up. So, But I'm going to answer your question real quick and then I need to get back on focus. Uh, when your hive swarms in the spring, that new queen goes to, uh, she does what's called a maiden flight. And there will be drones, I mean, uh, there will be bees from all over to breed her. 
not exclusively that hive she come from. So you very well may get some interbreeding through that process. Does that make sense to you? So yes, but to, for them to just mingle hive side by side temporarily, no. I mean, there's reasons for that, and we'll talk about that next Saturday. But no, they won't intermingle as a hive. The only way that you'll get some of those other characteristics through breeding is when that new queen in swarming takes maiden flight and she goes into the maiden field and she's bred by a series of bees before she comes back. Okay? So you can you possibly can pick up traits like that. My my practice has been if I want to change my hive, I do it through the queen. So I'll just order a new queen. If I like I, I raised Italians for a long time and then I wanted to go to New World Carnolians, which is a new good morning folks, which is a kind of a new strain uh, that I'm finding is very excellent. Um, and I bought some queens out of California and brought them in, introduced them to the hive, and went that process. So then everything that she laid egg-wise was the New World Carnolian. And over a year's time, maybe a year and a half, my whole hive changed in complexion. Yes, ma'am. Um, you can do it by about three days before you know that new queen's coming because it takes about three days for that old queen's pheromones to dissipate in the hive. So that, that old uh, pheromone needs to, be dis needs to be gone or the bees won't accept the new queen. And actually, if you can do five days, that they, they get almost into kind of a, uh, I want to say this real respectfully, almost kind of desperate for a queen. So they'll readily, more readily accept her as a new queen. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's go back to clothing real quick. So you want to make sure that you cover your face with a jacket. For the longest time, I used just a, a windbreaker um, and a bee hat and a veil. You can get a lot of money wrapped up in beekeeping. I'm going to tell you right now. So my family we were more conservative and we didn't spend bukus of money in our bee yard um, because honestly you get to a point where there's no return uh, hopefully you I mean there's a lot of satisfaction a lot of fulfillment in it but unless you got really big bank accounts I mean we need to be mindful of our expense level or I think we need to be mindful of our expense level if you've got really that much money and it's okay and you don't mind, uh, if the bees won't do it for you, I can start me a GoFundMe project and you can, I'll give you my name and number. Um, get you a bee hat, get you a good bee hat. It just kind of helps the veil set up above. When the veil's on, you don't want it to lean against your face anywhere. You want it back because if they go to bouncing off of that by an aggression, then you know uh, you're still, you know that you're safe. So get you a hat. It keeps the veil away from the, the head and the parts of your head. Gloves, you'll want a pair of gloves initially as a new beekeeper, uh, just to be safe. I will tell you it's a little bit cumbersome trying to handle frames with gloves, so be very mindful of the gloves you buy. Make sure they fit your fingers really good. Once in a while, you will get a bee to sting you through this leather, not very often, but once in a while they can penetrate that, but by and large, that's not the case. So check your finger pattern, make sure it fits nice and snug, that you can use it. You wanna be able to pick up a quarter or something like that with the finger. That way you can work with the hive and work with the frames without any problem. You can tape your boots if you want. Um, your pant legs, if you decide to just use baggy legs, I usually don't. Once in a while, I'll feel one crawling up my leg. He's found his way underneath the cuff of my pants. It's, it's totally up to you. I've done it long enough now that it doesn't really bother me until they get way up the leg and then I get a little nervous. But uh, that don't happen very often, so I don't worry about that too much. I just go in a baggy pant and a boot. Um, I do encourage maybe a high top boot if you would. If you've got just a tennis shoe on, they'll find your sock and nail your ankles. Uh, the other thing is I was in a bee yard, in my bee yard, it's been four years ago, 
and I had four hives there that I was working and it was a nice sunny day. Uh, bees were working good and I had my hands full. I had a, a box in my hand moving it and I stepped and I felt something squishy under my foot and I had my hands full, I didn't think about it. I just didn't even look. And all of a sudden something hit me in the back of the leg. And boy, I thought, man, I've never had a bee sting me like that. Um, the longer I worked, the more it hurt. And finally I had to stop and go and take a look and see what it was. And I had two puncture marks in the back of my leg. One of them had caught the top of my boot. The other one missed it and got my leg. And uh, I was a little concerned at that point. Uh, my wife got panicked and I went home that night and my leg swelled and got real stiff and red. And I said, if it's this way in the morning, we'll go to the doctor. But fortunately I Epsom salt it and it was a snake bite, I was sure of that. So wear boots just to protect yourself because when you're in the bee yard, you don't have time to really be paying attention to what's around you too awful much. Uh, so you wanna be as protective as you can. Questions? Any questions about clothing? So I want to make sure that you're protected the best you can. If you're a smoker, you wanna be very careful with that. Smoking, the scent of cigarettes, really lights them up. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. We were in uh, Georgia for Nixa Hardware about 10 years ago, eight years ago, and we were in a warehouse at this apiary. We were picking up 250 packages of bees, and they had bees in this warehouse where they had just loaded. I mean, there's probably a thousand packages in there. And we were waiting to load, and one of the girls that works there, one of the daughters of the owner, she came in and she lit up a cigarette, and man, it sounded like war zone. I mean, them bees lit up like a Christmas tree and started buzzing and carrying on. If you're a smoker, you want to be really careful of that. Any scenting at all, you want to be real cautious with um, because bees pick that up. They're very sensitive to that, and they'll know that. So you just want to be, use wisdom, relax, Make sure you're protected. Know that you're safe, even if they go to dinging on you or bouncing off of you. Know that you're okay and you're not gonna get hurt in a serious way. You may get a bee sting or two, but that's okay. You'll get used to that. It's gonna be part of the game. Everybody good? Yes, sir. Once you get them all good and pissed off, how long does it take for them to calm back down? A, a minute or two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go to the truck and drink you a cup of coffee and relax because it's going to be a while. And in fact, when they get that really agitated, I, I sometimes if I've got that hive closed up, I, I just leave them alone because the next day is the better option, okay? Because you can wait an hour and go back and the least little thing will re-trigger immediately. So... The weather is a huge factor in keeping bees, and we're going to talk extensively about that uh, in one of our other sessions. But when you're keeping bees and you're going to work that hive or break into that hive, and what I mean when I say that is open the top of that hive, you want to, you want to be mindful of your weather conditions. As I said earlier, when the barometer is changing and there's storm fronts coming in, bees get a little agitated because they know that they're fixing to be hive bound through this storm. So their, their mission and their order is to work, work, work. I mean, the worker bee lives six weeks and all they do is in and out, in and out, in and out. So when they know they're gonna to have to be confined, they get a little irritated because things are gonna change and they don't wanna be messed with or interrupted from what their daily projects are or their workload is. So watch that. Ideally, I like to see the temperatures. I never try to get into my hive under 55 degrees. There is a chill factor there for bees. A bee will chill at 43, deg 43 degrees. At 41 degrees, death is pretty imminent for them. So if there's a little wind and it's 55 degrees, I'm taking a big risk. I can also chill the larva in that brood chamber, which is really dangerous. So I watch that temperature. In an ideal world, I want at least 60 degrees. I'd love to see 65, sunny, minimal wind. If it's a real windy day, they're not gonna like you being there. So if it's calm, and I like, now different beekeepers will tell you different with this. 
I like early morning working my bees. Some beekeepers will say, no, let's do mid-afternoon. There's more of the workers out of the hive. That theory is correct. But early morning, the bees seem to be much more docile. And I, I can enjoy doing that. And plus, I'm an early morning kind of person. So when I get out there and I'm out there with God and nature and my bees, I'm a very happy camper. Uh, when you're working your bees, there's several options to the way you want to break into your hive. Uh, the old timers used to use, and pardon that expression if you don't mind, when I say that I talk about my grandfather and my dad, they used to use a smoker. Smoke them bees. Um, that's okay. You can use a smoker. It's not a problem. Sometimes you want to be really careful of the material that you use to create that smoke. You want a cool, if I can use that expression, a cool smoke, the one that doesn't get real hot. Newspaper will get extremely hot. Uh, pine needles get pretty hot. What we used to use was burlap and it, it creates a nice smooth smoke. My dad tickles me to death. He is scared to death of a bee sting. And he and I were working a hive a couple of years ago, I mean, not long ago. And uh, I said, I'll get in here and I'll, I'll, we were gonna pull the honey out of this super. It had been there most of the summer. And he said, okay, I'll smoke. So we lifted the lid off and we started to break the inner cover off. And man, he went to doing this number. And I'm like, dad, dad, you're gonna kill him. Plus you're choking me to death. I said, just relax. So just give him an easy puff, just to calm him down. That's all you have to do. One thing that you need to know about smoking bees though, smoking bees has a tendency to set off an alarm to the hive that there's a fire close by and it sends them into a different mode. It will calm them and you can work with them through that if it's a good cool smoke, but just know that what it does to the inside of that hive and the signal that it sends to them. What I use and I, I'm gonna share this with you i use sugar water i haven't smoked a hive of bees since i was with my dad two years ago he did that i never did it before then before then what i use is a sugar water and i mix a one-to-one -one solution so a cup of sugar a cup of water <clears throat> i usually go the night before and i boil my water put my sugar in it let it dissolve and set overnight uh, or let it cool down you don't want to do it obviously while it's hot, but let it cool down, put it in my bottle, and then I can mist them. What that does to the bees is they start feeding off of that sugar water. They'll feed off of each other. You can actually move them around, move them down in the frames. And every frame that I put in my hive, I'll mist it with sugar water. It's an attraction to them. They like it, they utilize it, and it's good for them. So this has been by far the best method that I have found for working my bees. If you're more comfortable with a smoker and smoking bees, that's your privilege and that's your liberty. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so you just spray the sugar water straight into the hive? Just spray it. When you open that hive, that uh, those top frames will be covered with bees. Right. Just start smoking them. Okay. Uh, start spraying them. Just mist them and you don't have to pour it on them, just mist them down good and lightly, and you'll start to see them settle and react and move around. A lot of times they'll go back down in the hive with it. If you need to move them a little more, just keep misting them until you get them to do what you want. Well, the smoker we have tried this year, and I can't keep it. Can't, can't keep it lit? lit. So what, what product do you use in the smoker? The burlap. <clears throat> so with the burlap, this is what we always done. We'll cut us a strip about this long and we roll it, tie it off, and then take and shred one end and light the end that you've shredded. Let it catch good where you've got good uh, fire going and then stuff that end in the smoker first. And you'll have to keep working, pumping it to keep that fire going, but that seems to work really well. Well, it, actually it serves a good purpose because you're feeding your bees as you do it. Um, and it, while we're at this point, I love to use Honey Bee Healthy. So anytime I make sugar water, I put Honey Bee Healthy in it. Um, 
takes one tablespoon, a one teaspoon per quart. This is one of the best things you can do for your hive. Anytime you feed your bees, I would encourage you to have Honey Bee Healthy in it. Honey Bee Healthy is an all natural, uh, organic, it's got camellia, lemongrass, it's got several different herbs like that in it. And you want to, I like using it. I see a major difference in my bees when I use the Honey Bee Healthy. Now, whenever you put Honey Bee Healthy in your sugar water, make sure your sugar water is cool. If it's hot, it'll change the complexion of this product and they won't like it. They won't go after it. So make sure your sugar water's cooled down. Put your Honey Bee Healthy in according to how much sugar water you've made and utilize it. I also have used Honey Amino Boost and I've used it in conjunction with the Honey Bee Healthy. To be honest with you, what I've saw is the bees prefer this over the Honey Bee Healthy. But I don't think that the Amino Boost gives all the overall health benefit that Honey Bee Healthy does. So I use both from time to time, depending on the time of your spring time of year, especially when I'm trying to grow my hive and build it. I'll use both products and it's the same teaspoon per quart and just mix them both in there. Yes. Oh, I do. I use them together. Can you use it too often or like, no? No. No. So in the spring of the year, a lot of times you want to feed your bees starting out because uh, typically early spring is a challenging time. Most people used to, you, we used to think that November and December was the hard months for bees. That's not true. Actually, February is the hardest month for bees. February and March. So we start feeding the best we can as long as the weather will allow us to. And I always put sugar water and I do both of them and you, you can't overdo it. They'll get along fine with it. Any other questions? Any questions about smoking or controlling your bees? There are products out there like uh, Fisher makes a product, Bee Be Gone, not Bee Be Gone, but uh, I forget the name of it. Anyway, there are products out there that you can buy and mist on them. It's not necessary. The most inexpensive avenue is either the sugar water or the smoking process. Okay? So that basically has you ready to go to the bee yard. The other items that you will want after you have... Uh, got dressed up and ready to go is you will want a hive tool you need something bees will seal every part of this hive body if you have an inner cover on it or an inner screen they'll seal it they want the inside of this hive as tight as it can be where nothing can get in so that you'll have to pry and break the uh, the rosin that they produce inside that hive so you'll need this. I like a pair of frame grips. If I'm pulling frames out of the hive, once I get them broke loose, it allows me to use them. You have to watch them close though, because if you drop a frame out of it, it's going to get exciting real quick. Okay. I've had that to happen and it does create a lot of excitement. So frame grips are good. Most of the time, I do have frame grips most of the time. I just use my hands because I feel like I'm more in control. I'll break the hive of the, uh, that frame loose on each end, pick it up with my gloves so I can examine that frame. But you'll need, I'm not a big fan of the bee brush. We used to think we had to have a bee brush to brush them off, you know. Makes them mad. Makes them mad. So I, I don't even take my bee brush to the bee yard anymore that agitates them when you sweep them like that. If you got bees that you need to move around on the frame, you can actually lift that frame and blow on it and they'll f separate and move and do whatever you want to. And let's say you've got a frame up and you're looking for the queen and you've got a cluster of bees right here in this corner and you think, oh, she's probably under that cluster. Just lift it up there, blow gently on it. They'll dissipate and move over to the side for you, okay? So really everything that I go to the bee yard with is my gloves, my sugar water, and my hive tool. Depending on what I'm doing, 
obviously, but if I'm just going for inspection purposes and to look at my brood, brood frames to see how they're doing or look at my honey frames to see what's going on, there's basically all the elements that I need to make that happen. Well, good, you ready to go? Get ready to go to BR. I'm gonna watch this time a little bit. I wanna talk in about an hour and then we'll break for a few minutes. Any questions on the Honey Bee Healthy and or the Amino Boost? Okay, let's talk about the hive itself. Let me break this down real quick so we can start from the bottom. used to be in the olden days when my grandfather and my dad was keeping bees the wooden hive body a uh, wooden hive bottom was the only option out there and a lot of the old timers and when I say old timers my grandfather's age uh, they used to build their own they're still strong I still use this particular hive bottom I don't use any of the others that are available I just really like this one and I'll explain why you can see that on one side it's deeper on the other side it's shallower so there's reasons for that in the summertime you want the deep side up for airflow so you want your hive sitting on top for airflow the winter time Golly, they got that one built wrong. The winter time, you want it like this. That restricts your airflow. You want the least amount of cold air going into that hive. But the hive bottom is something that uh, the, the solid bottom board is what it's called. Is something that we used uh, for years. Nowadays, they have other ones like this that have screen bottom in it, which helps with the airflow. It also has a tray that pulls out that allows you to see what's going on in the hive so you can treat your bees you can treat your bees and you can see what they shed you can kind of tell what's going on in the hive if you see a lot of of uh, clippings from the beeswax you'll know they're doing a lot of cleaning uh, sometimes you'll see the dead little dead larva if you see a lot of that you know there may be something going on in, inside the hive so this little board kind of helps you visualize what's going on and you can inspect that before you ever open the hive which gives you a little heads up about what you might find inside your hive there are other ones I think there's like two or three different ones that Nixa Hardware carries uh, they all serve different purposes the reason I use the solid bottom board is I use it in conjunction with a screened inner cover this is called an inner cover um, there are solid inner covers my granddad used to use a piece of paneling that's what he used you want a you want an inner cover on it just to keep all the predators out of the top of the hive but the reason I like the screen is because it allows a good airflow up through the hive and in July and August you want some airflow in that hive what you'll learn about your bees is they will control the temperature of that hive regardless but what you do need to know is if you close it up too much they will overheat and they'll die or they'll overheat and you'll create a mold issue inside that hive so airflow through that hive is pretty critical even in the dead of winter the last three years I've not done anything I've left this on all winter long and got along great just changed the spacing in the bottom board so it slowed down the hive or the airflow in the hive but I still allowed the airflow to go through with my screen top now I could use the solid through the winter time I hope I'm not losing you here now if I am I'm sorry I can use the solid inner cover but I have to really be careful about it. I did have a hive with a solid inner cover get too hot I had a moisture issue mold issue and when you get mold in it they're gone they just will not stay so they're real protective of what goes on inside questions about bottom board this is an inner cover this is a bottom board and this is a bottom this is the very foundation that everything sets on okay, that's what I, now I have the screen 
green top, but I on the top right now I have the solid with the circle okay. cut out. So when is it time to switch to this? I get into May. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even late April, you can switch. Like I say, I leave mine on year round. I used to think that I had to go in in October, November and change and put the solids on. One year I had I had a boatload of hives I, and I had one bee yard that I missed. I had f two hives that I f forgot to change out. When I got to those two hives, they were the strongest two hives that, that made it through the winter. I'm like, I'm not doing this no more. I'm just, I need to reduce my workload. Can you show us how that stacks and how you yep. go about changing that? Because I understand that, but I don't, visually I need to see it. Okay. okay, so after your bottom board, the next piece is your, let me walk through this and then I will. The next piece is your brood box. The brood box is a nine and three eighths or nine and an eight. Nine and an eighth by 16 three quarters. This is where everything goes on with the queen and her raising her young. So the brood box is real critical. You can see the deep frame and you, the options of wax we'll talk about, but the deep frame is real important. They need, she needs plenty of room. You need to understand that a good queen, a good queen can lay up to 1,500 eggs a day. So when you go to calculating how many cells are on here and how many she's laying, she needs lots of room to move. And she, it's, it's a real treat to see this happen. When you watch her, she just backs up to that cell that the, the worker bees have cleaned out. She drops the egg, she moves on, drops an egg, moves on, drops. I mean, it was a real thrill to get to see that happen. But they will lay in abundance. She will lay, if she's in her prime and she's good and healthy, she can lay as much as 1,500 eggs a day. So the brood box is critical. Now, what you're going to find is in most brood boxes, most of her work will be in the middle six frames. As a rule, she will work in the middle of this high frame and usually six frames across once in a while seven depending on how progressive she is um, the reason for that is normally what they do with the outside two frames is honey stores that's part of their ability to survive the winter so this is where they put their food storage in the outside two frames I have seen hives where she started on the side and went one direction but by and large, in the normal order, she'll take the middle four, five, six frames and she'll lay her eggs and her brood there. You'll see nectar all around it. You'll see pollen all around it. That's what they use to feed with. So that's basically what that looks like. And I've got some handouts that'll give you an idea of what that happens to look like. A good queen, she will take and she'll she'll do a half moon like this on that bottom frame and she'll fill all of that middle or maybe if she's real progressive the whole thing but she tries to leave room in the corners for pollen honey and nectar so they can feed that young but most of the time an ideal in an ideal world what they like to see is a half moon where she's done that. When you take a second brood box and put on top of it, she'll do a full circle. She'll do her half moon upside down, so she's done a complete circle like this in that hive. Now you won't see that real often. Most of the time you'll see brood just scattered throughout this whole uh, frame. You can kind of judge the character and the age of the queen by her brood pattern. If she's real spotty, she's got brood here, 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 here. What you really want to see is a pretty solid mass of brood with maybe an empty hole once in a while. But if she's real spotty and she's all over the road, she's either a young queen or she's an older queen on her way out. Or she may be uh, crippled or hurt. Normally when they get hurt, the bees will get rid of her. 
If she's young, she'll be real erratic in her, in her laying pattern. Uh, a queen bee has a good, healthy lifespan of about four years. You'll see them live longer, but normally four years is the healthiest lifespan. And when she's in her prime, year two, and particularly year three, she will be pretty solid with that brood pattern through here. Uh, like I say, if she's real erratic, you know you've got a young queen. That doesn't mean you need to get rid of her. That means you be patient with her, especially if she comes out of a good mother queen. If you're buying nukes, or you're buying package bees, you don't know what that looks like. So don't give up on her too quick. Give her a year and see if she matures and she does better. The second year, if she's still real erratic and she hasn't made any improvement, might be time to think about changing her. But typically the middle six frames is what they want to work with. Well, good. Questions? So the eight frame, there is, this is a 10 frame. There is eight frames that they come up with. They've become pretty popular. Uh, the reason, basic reason is weight. So uh, ladies can get along with eight frames a lot better. If you're elderly, they can get along with it. This will weigh about 90 pounds when it's full, just this brood box. Eight frame will weigh probably about 70 pounds, maybe 75. So weight is the big factor. I will tell you that if you go to an eight frame, everything inside the hive moves a lot faster. So you have to be mindful of that. So where they've got 10 frames to work, now they only have their two less, everything inside moves a lot faster. So whatever you per prefer is totally your call. It's your call. But just know that there are some handoff trade-offs for that, okay? Any questions about the brood chamber? Yeah. I've been afraid to, but I notice nectar dripping out of that bottom. Okay. Is that normal? Not normal, but it's not a bad sign. It's not a bad sign. Huh. There's been a lot of good nectar flow this spring. We've had, so far, other than being a little cool, we've had a real good uh, nectar flow, pollen, and all of that going for us. And it's been going for about a good five weeks now. Um, pollen will start back in February, cedar trees and different things like that. But when you start seeing flowering like dandelions and hen bed and, and weeds, like what we call weeds, uh, bees actually work those things and work those products. We've been in pretty good order. Uh, we really need some warm weather that will make this hive pop, you know, make your hive really get go to town. I wouldn't worry about it, okay. no. I'd be more worried if I didn't see any nectar in there than I would be of just seeing it drip. Okay, okay. Anybody else? Okay, so 10 frame, eight frame, whichever you choose. This piece is what I call the brood box. Some people call it a hive box. This is the, this is the where I call the hive's home. In my operation, I do two of these and call that their hive, that's their home. I take nothing away from it. So the reason I do two of them is because I wanna make sure they have plenty of honey stores to get through the winter. A lot of people, if you talk to Al Markley over at the store, he'll tell you to do one and what this is what's called a super. So it's not hardly as, as you can tell, doesn't have hardly as much available, but he uses one of these and one of these, and that's his hive body. That's what he calls his hive body or his home. I like two. It gives my queen much more room to work. She can lay a lot more cells. And honestly, they've proven scientifically, two of these will give you almost 8,000 more bees in your hive compared to this and this. And that means a lot more workers, that means a lot more production of honey, uh, nectar, pollen, and all the things they need for that hive to survive. So I double stack these. You have to use one at a time. Don't just put two boxes on there because a bee's nature is to go up. That is their nature. 
And if you put two boxes on there that are empty, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the top first. The problem with that is when winter comes, you don't have nothing down here. So make them fill out this top, this box first. When they get eight of those frames, maybe nine of those frames pretty well filled out and full, then you can put your next box on. One of the things about letting them run out of room is that creates the swarming situation. So you kind of have to watch what's going on there. Uh, you don't want to give them too much to begin with, but you don't want to let them run out of room either because if they run out of room, then they send a signal to that hive that says, hey, we don't have room, we need to swarm. And once that signal hits the, the market in there, you can't hardly change your mind. So you just kind of have to do a check, check, and check. How often should you get into your hive? How often do you think? Good. Anybody else? In the beginning of the spring of the year is when the most activity is going on with your hive. When when warm weather gets here and it gets to where you can get into that hive safely with weather conditions, you're going to find a lot going on. Theoretically, that queen starts laying young in February. So she'll start in February and you think about it, she starts slow. She won't come out of the gate doing 1500 eggs a day, but she'll build her way up. By the time the 1st of April gets here, she should be in full gear. So you think about from mid-February or late February through March, she's already laid a lot of eggs. Takes how long for an egg to hatch, a worker egg to hatch? 21 days. So what she's laid in February, by the time the first of April, they've already hatched. That batch is already hatched. So the progression continually is growing. By May 1st, that hive is going to be exploding. So weather-wise, the sooner we can get into that hive and see what's going on and have, get a good handle on the health of the hive, the more effective and the better it will be for us to know how to work with that hive. If you've got, if you're buying a nuke, you'll start out with five frames, put them in a hive box, put your frames to the side of those five, your additional five, let them fill them out before you add that second box. When they get eight or nine of those frames pretty well full and filled out, then you put a second box on because she's going to go up as soon as you do it. She's going to go right straight up to the next level. That allows her to keep growing that keeps the worker bees working and aggressive and that's their social order that's what they know to do so we as a beekeeper we're not making them do anything we're just there to accommodate what they know to do and when we get to that point and we'll talk about installing nukes in the last session of this. But when they get to that point of putting them in the brood box, give them plenty of room, but let's watch their progression of growth and make sure that we stay a step ahead of them so that they don't f become afraid they're running out of room. Question, yes. Very good question. The question was, can you check your hive too often? And my answer to you is yes. Um, and yes, it does have a tendency. If they, Every time you get into that hive, you break the cycle of production for that hive. That's just a proven fact. Now, without question, we have to get into that hive for the health and the well-being of that hive so we can help accommodate what they need to get done. But every time you do, you, you understand that you're breaking a cycle that's going on inside that hive. They recover quickly. It's not something that's detrimental to them, but it is a fact that takes place. Um, I have seen bee teachers, beekeeper class teachers tell you, check them every week, every week, every week. In the spring of the year, I am more conscientious about that. Week to 10 days, 
because that's when everything is really exploding inside that hive and I need to stay on top of it. But when I get into May, most of what the explosion that's been going on and the growth that's going on has taken place, then I, I back away. And, and to be honest with you, I don't like getting into my hive every week. If I can see my hive is healthy, if I see they're doing good, the queen's doing her thing, the worker bees, they're getting plenty of nect nectar and pollen, I may, I may wait 10 days or two weeks because I just don't like disrupting what they're doing. If I see that everything is going good when we get into May, I'm going to pull back every three weeks unless I've got a super that's filling up that I need to either pull or add to. Okay, so I'm not a big advocate of breaking into that hive unless it's the spring of the year when you need to stay on top of what's going on because things change in this hive at rapid pace in the spring of the year. The weather is a huge factor with all of that. So like we've stayed cool, predominantly cool this spring up to this point. So things are not moving as fast inside that hive, even though we've got a lot of nectar and a lot of pollen because it's staying cooler. They have to work harder to keep that hive warm. So a lot of those worker bees are staying inside the hive, making sure that hive is staying warm for the larva that the queen is raising. That larva needs a body temperature of 89 to 93 degrees. So they have to work hard and they do it by fanning to keep that hive warm. So when warm weather gets here and we start getting up into 80s and 85s, everything's going to break loose. It's going to really go to town. What about in the fall? Does, it, does the frequency change? From yeah, in the fall of the year, I'm not as concerned about the hive because they're dialing down getting ready for winter. So what you'll see come 1st of October is those that queen will quit laying. She'll lay a lot less, so the numbers will start reducing, and they'll go through the winter with a small cluster of bees. How often would you check in the fall? So I want everything, I don't want my bees robbed of honey if I'm going for honey production by September 1. When goldenrod comes out, it changes the taste of your honey. It's a more, it makes it bitter. So I want my honey stores that I'm going to pull for food. I want it done by September 1. I then begin to work treating my hive for varroa mites with whatever method I'm going to use. And I've used Apovar for the last five or six years. I begin to treat my hives then. So I don't have to get into that hive near as often. Everything's dialing down. They're kicking the drones out. They're dialing down in the numbers. Everything's going to a survival mode for the winter. So my being there is not as critical as important. So it would be like every three weeks? Come on. Unless, unless we've had a real dry summer and their honey stores are real weak, then I know I've got to start feeding. Yep. So every three weeks is fine. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Got a new coming first part of May. Give right. Or take. And once I get them in their box. Yes. How often should I check to make sure the queen is doing all right? Should I feed them? Because I know all the blooming things will be winding down by then. So yes and yes, I would feed them. That way they'll know there's a food source number one and i put honey be healthy in it because i want to make sure that health that hive is healthy you the the challenge with this is you don't know the nuke you don't know the bees so i want to do my part to make sure that they're healthy with honey be healthy and amino booster which either one um, once i put them in i want to give them a couple of three days to settle and then i'll go back I watch the front of my hive. Whenever I'm checking my bees, the first thing I do is I stand back and watch the front of my hive. If I can see good business pattern coming in and out of that hive, things are probably good insight. Um, and I would do that with my nuke for the first week. I'd give them a week inside that hive before I broke it open. Okay. And then you'll want to look and see if the queen, when you put those frames in, be real observant of what your brood patterns look like and how much brood there is. So when you go back in a week, you can see if she's laid new brood. And actually, you can tell by the color of the brood, by the color of the brood, if she's doing her job. But give them a week 
if you would. Let them settle. Let them call that home and let them know that's where they belong. And it'll be all right. Okay, any other questions about the brood box? There's a lot that we could cover there. I could spend the rest of today right here because there's so much that goes on right here. And it's fascinating to watch. There's, um, but for the sake of setting up our hive, let me stay focused here and do this. This is an entrance reducer. So you, if, if you have a problem with predators like wasp and hornets, you can use an entrance reducer. You want the big in the summer. You want the small in the winter. Fall of the year, particularly, you will use this. When, it's, when it gets into October, wasp and hornets and yellow jackets, they'll be all over your hive wanting food storage because they know cold weather's coming and they know that there's no source out there for them to pull from. So they'll come to this hive and you'll have to deal with that. So a good entrance reducer is critical. Through the spring and the summer, if I don't have a problem, I don't even use one of these. But if I do see that I've got a problem with spiders or uh, wasp or yellow jackets or anything like that, then I might put an entrance reducer on it. What you're doing though, be mindful of this, is you're restricting the airflow in that hive. Okay? Okay, after our main body, we're starting our hive. Then I use a, what this is called an inner cover or a hive cover. And what it's designed is they will propolis this down tighter than a jug. I mean, that's why you have to have a hive tool because Dick's hat band won't fit in any, anywhere. I mean, it's tight. So I like the screen and this is my personal preference. I put the screen inner cover on and I, I just use it like that. That allows my airflow because I'm using the solid bottom board. Remember, I'm using the solid bottom board in mine. So I've got the airflow going up through the hive, allowing uh, a good flow of air up through there. That also allows me, when I take my lid off, I can look at my hive without bees up in my face. I like that. I can miss them initially through that screen inner cover before I ever take it off and get control of my hive. So I'm a huge fan of the screen inner cover. I think it's one of the smartest things they ever made for the hive. But that doesn't mean you have to go that direction. That's just the pros and the cons that I find. The cons to it is over time, them bees will wax this all up. They'll want to fill it in. Remember, they want this hive dark and closed in. And this is, they can see spiders will get up here and they can see predator wasps will walk around up here. They can see all that. They'll start putting wax all over this. And over a course of a couple of years, they'll completely fill this in with, with wax because they don't want nothing in there. So you have to take it to the house and you have to take hot water and melt it off or some avenue. But initially, I like them because it allows me to open up my hive without the risk of bees just flying up in my face. Okay, inner covers next, and then the last thing is your lid. If you'll notice this inner cover, it's got cutouts to where it lifts the lid for airflow. The other thing it does is it allows spiders to crawl up in there. They can't get down in the screen, but you'll find them on top once you take that lid off. You'll see them. They're not anything that's going to jump up at you and bite you, but they're there and uh, they're waiting for the opportunity to get a food source is what they're doing. So your inner cover is next and then your lid. This is the old standard lid. It's wood, tin top. There also is this hard plastic style. They last forever. I have these, I have these. These will, over the years, tend to rot out. Um, these will never. I mean, they last forever, and they're a very good hive top. No, no drawbacks that I see to them. When you paint your hive, you'll want to paint everything. If you buy wooden products like this, everything on the outside. Paint nothing on the inside. The paint fumes will be detrimental to your bees 
everything on the outside. And you can paint them whatever colors you want to paint them. If you like pink, if you like yellow, if you're a lady, and I've seen them painted yellow with flowers on them. I mean, it's amazing to see what all the bees don't care. I would shy away from dark colors because it just gives in the sun and in the heat of the summer, it just makes your hive hotter. So a white or a light color is great. I do see from time to time camel painted hives and that's because they have in that particular area problem with theft. So they paint them camel colored so they're, they don't stand out because you can see a white hive a quarter of a mile away camel colored and people will steal them. So you, if that's an issue where you're at, then camel color's fine. But whatever you want to do, just be mindful not to paint anything on the inside, everything on the outside. Any questions? And I would prime my wood first. So put a coat of primer on and then a latex. Outdoor paint's fine. Any questions? I've seen on the internet wax coated. Is there any benefit really to having a wax coated? Hive body? Yeah. How does that work? It's dipped in wax. And what does it do in the middle of the summer? I don't know. I just I've just seen it on the internet. They, so they, they have commercial grade wax. They dip it in, and then they brush on the bees' wax. Did they give you a geographical region? I didn't pay attention. Okay. So the reason the reason I asked that question is we're really fortunate here because we don't have real serious winters. When you get into Michigan and Wisconsin, it's a whole different world for them and they have to take precautions for wind break, uh, anything they can do to seal that hive because the, the bees will keep the temperature inside the hive where they want it to be. But for the beekeeper, you have to do wind breaks. You have, I mean, in Michigan and Wisconsin, they wrap blankets around their bees. Don't do it here because it creates a false sense of ambient temperature to your hive here because we don't have that serious of a winter. But up there, it gets really serious. They have to make sure up there when they get three foot of snow that the front of these hives are open. They've got some airflow. If you completely close this hive up in the winter, they'll suffocate and die. So they have to make sure. So the world's different there. And I can see where a wax coating might be more effective there just for the protection problem. Yep. Yeah. The other thing they do there in, in, in Michigan and Wisconsin is they combine hives. So they'll take the queen out and put another hive so that their clusters and their numbers are bigger so they can create the heat they need to survive. So each geographical region has a different set of circumstances that they have to contend with. Here, we're pretty fortunate. We can kind of rock through year round and get, be all right. I do see people here that'll put up bales of hay and uh, to provide a windbreak, but I do not encourage putting blankets around this or changing anything to the outside because you create a false sense of ambient temperature to that hive. So what happens is they think that it's warm outside because you've wrapped that hive so well and they come out on that landing board and it's 40 degrees. What happens? Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. So we want to be careful about that. Yes. Have you ever had any experience with the Apame hives? With who? Apame? Uh, obviously not. No. <laughs> so tell me about... It's we just bought. It's uh, the plastic in, it's self-insulated. They're supposed to regulate temperatures and the um, bad humidity like we get here and also up in the cold temperatures up north. I'm not familiar with that. That's new. Apame. Apame. Yeah. I'll look that up. We bought our whole setup. Good. <laughs> well, I'll be... I'll be anxious to hear how it works. Me too. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm doing the long hive. Have you done the long hive? The horizontal hives yeah. are great. Um, the, the yeah. Did you get that from Dr. Over at Ava? Uh, no. Just uh, went online? I went online on my stepdad's website. Online. Okay. Good. Uh, the horizontal hive is a, is a 
probably a pretty fascinating avenue. There is a good doctor over in Ava, and I, I can't call his name right now. He's an all-natural uh, beekeeper, and he uses nothing but the horizontal hives. You can, you can enlarge the hive so much better with that length, uh, and there's positives and negatives. The challenge with it is moving it, and once it's full, it's there. Um, but the horizontal hive has a lot of positives to it. So yes, that's a relatively new avenue that's come up in about the last four years, and it's gaining in popularity and doing well. I've seen a hand somewhere. Go ahead. Uh, you use any chemicals for cleaning for mold? For mold? Yeah. You can. If you have a mold issue and your hive is gone, you can. I would use bleach. bleach. Yep. It's an all-natural. Uh, the bees won't, it won't affect your bees or hurt your bees. Obviously your bees are not there, but when you get a new hive to put in it. Yep. Yes, ma'am. My neighbor's got some hives and he's got, it almost looks like a piece of styrofoam on the bottom board that he put in there for winter. Yep. Is that something that we should think about? So yes, if you're using this particular type of, of bottom board, take that tray out and put a piece of styrofoam in there because you got a screen bottom it's letting a massive amount of air in and that styrofoam slows that airflow and protects them bees so yes yes ma'am have you do you use any of like the milk paint sealer on this type of hive or do you actually need to use paint paint because i have a cedar swell hive also and on those on the body they recommend just a milk type paint So the reason they recommend that is because it is cedar, and cedar wood lasts forever. Mm -hmm. This is just an oak or pine, so I would go with an enamel paint. Okay. Yeah, I would. It won't have the longevity that your cedar does. Yes, sir. Uh, so about windbreaks specifically, what if we're talking about putting something kind of obscuring the hive? I've read that they don't like to fly over things, and they don't like they kind of like to go as the crow flies. So what do you recommend if we were to, I've got, where we're putting in, it's, it gets a lot of air, and I want to make sure that I'm not blowing all over the place. So, so how far away are you wanting your windbreak from the hive? Well, I guess I was going to ask you, is what, what do you, re how the distance, and what do you recommend besides like a, a bale of hay? I was kind of thinking about like a small fence or something. You can, and I'd give them six feet of space out in front of that hive, at least six, six to eight. They'll adapt to it. They'll come out and learn, you know. If you're right in the face of that hive, you're gonna have a real issue. But if you come out there six foot, you shouldn't have a problem. They're usually up by that time anyway. I've seen another hand somewhere. Yes, sir. Why paint them white? You don't have to. White's the coolest color in the middle of the summer. Yeah. So it reflects the heat a lot better. Yes, ma'am. If you have multiple hives, is it better to paint them different colors? I've heard that so the bees can identify which hive next. Is there anything to that? No, it won't matter to the bees because I'm on the bees respond and react to the pheromone of the queen. So whatever queen is in here and her pheromone is distinct. There's like 117 chemicals in her pheromone. So each one queen has their own distinctive, non-replicable pheromone. So those bees know where she, you can have a black, uh, a yellow hive here and a blue hive here. It won't matter. You can paint them whatever color you want. Yes, sir. You're talking about uh, their recognizable pheromones. I read in one book, they said at the entrance, make a mark of some kind, I paint a flower on one and do another one on another. When they come out, they, they circle around, they look at that and they see that identifying mark and say, that's my home, this is where I come back to. I read that in the book. <laughs> I don't know that I would agree with that. Um, the fact that it's a flower may be the triggering point on that whole situation. Yeah. Because you that's- can paint, You can put any kind of design on any it. Any design? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I would, buy that myself if if that's what you feel like need to do then you can do that yeah well when i put up my first two hives back in 2018 when i started uh, my wife painted some decorations on the front of it because that's what the book said to do yeah so the bees can identify where to come back to okay and that's the reason i did it okay so. 
Yes, sir. When setting up a, a new hive with a installing a new nuke, is that all you start with? Is the base, the brood box, the inner cover, and the lid, and that's it? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yep. When do you start adding the other pieces to it? As they fill this out. So as they grow, and you get eight to nine frames full, mm -hmm. then I would add my second brood box. And then when do you add like a super or the excluder and all of those pieces? When Whenever they fill it. So you want them to fill a box at a time. Okay. That's the process. Okay, let's take about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll talk more about this and the setup of this, okay? There's water back in this corner. There's restrooms right here.